Okay, hi, my name is Andrew Cohen. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Millennium Labs. I'm happy to be here. In thinking about the introduction today, I found a quote. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. That quote is from Gandhi. And I think that quote represents us and what we do on a, on a daily basis. It also represents Patrick Kennedy. In his public life, he first served the people of Rhode Island in their state legislator and as a congressman for the US government. During that time, he was involved in a lot of mental health activity and awareness programs, but he was instrumental and the chief sponsor in writing and passing the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equality Act. It's a bill that required most health plans to provide coverage for the treatment of mental awareness and mental illness that's comparable to what they provide for physical illness. After 11 years of serving in the United States Congress, as a private citizen, he continues his service by co-founding One Mind for Research. Um, I don't know how many of you know what One Mind for Research is. I'm sure he'll touch upon that. But when I was doing my uh, background research on this, in my excitement, I worked with a lot of young people and I said, I'm meeting the co-founder of One Direction. Um, which is a boys <laughs> band. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it, it caused some excitement back at the office and then we've realized what the problem was. Right. One Mind for Research is an organization that focuses on government agencies, um, academic institution, private sector organizations to, to focus their understanding of how the brain works and to solve the challenges of brain trauma and mental illness. So today, Congressman Kennedy is here to share with us his vision for focusing on the best practices within our field. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Patrick Kennedy. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Um, so when Andrew said that uh, there was a great deal of excitement in the office when he uh, missed spoke and said that I was the leader of One Direction and everybody was excited. It reminded me about what it's like in my family to be acknowledged because I get, you know, stopped all the time and people say, hey, Bobby, great work and all that good work you're doing on the environment. I said, no, 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 that's, that's you got the wrong cousin. You got the wrong, hey, Teddy, God, that's great work you're doing with the disabled. I said, no, 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 that, that's, that's my brother. Hey, Anthony, great work on that, Best. Sorry, that's not, I just, I just, I want to give a check. I said, fine, then okay, I'll be whoever you want me to be. <laughs> uh, so I uh, got elected to the uh, State House in Rhode Island uh, at 21, and then I got, as the youngest member of the state legislature, and then I got elected to the United States Congress at, at 27, and uh, 31, I was elected to Democratic leadership in my caucus, in the Congress. And of course, none of it had to do with my last name being Kennedy whatsoever. It was <laughs> my good looks and personality just got me straight to the top. So uh, I'm honored to be with all of you today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to have Millennium Labs uh, sponsor this and to also have a Rob Wagner and Foundations for Recovery be part of this great bringing people together because that's been my mission in uh, both Congress and after Congress is to bring people together, okay? Um, and boy, do we need that in our field. So I'll tell you a little bit about how important this is by giving you a few stories. So I, um, those of you who know how Washington works or any of our state capitals know that uh, if you want to be a sponsor of a really important piece of legislation, you usually have to have a lot of gray hair, right? You've got to be around a long time. So my father, uh, Senator Edward Kennedy, got to sponsor like landmark pieces of legislation. Um, he'll go down in history as one of the most uh, productive United States senators in, in the Senate history. And, and he, but he was there for nearly 50 years. 
he was chairman of like the big committees. So like there wasn't a big piece of legislation that came through where if he wanted to put his name on it, I mean, there was no one who was going to argue. I mean, he was the guy. So I say that because, as I said, I was the youngest member of Congress from the smallest state in the country <laughs> and in the minority party because Newt Gingrich was speaker when I was elected. But I got to be the first name to go on a bill that said the brain was part of the body. That said that mental health could not be separated from whole health. That said mental health care is physical health care. That's what my bill said. <clears throat> so that says a lot because if it was a popular bill, people would be fighting me for the chance to put their name first on that bill. But no one, it seemed like, wanted to have the words mental health and addiction anywhere near their name. Okay, so fast forward, you know, it was another 12 uh, years before we got the bill passed. But just prior to that, um, I, uh, you know, was grappling with my own mental health and addiction issues. Uh, and even though I was the champion of mental health, I too did not want the label. So I thought I would sneak away in, during my Christmas kind of holiday, because no one would really ask, where is he? He's on vacation. So that I could detox from Oxycontin. And, uh, so I arrive at the Mayo Clinic, and I said, uh, first and foremost, I'm really important, so you can't <laughs> send me down the hall to the mental health clinic. You've got to take that mental health clinic and bring it to me. Like, I've got to stay in St. Elizabeth's here, because if I get sent down to that generous, boy, the word will be out, and, you know, my, my career will be ruined. So... Uh, that's just another indication, anecdotally, that even though I am a guy that's supposed to be out there, you know, trying to take on stigma, I too, you know, deep down, feel that stigma and shame. So what did I do? Of course, I got my physical allergy addressed. I, I got clean after, you know, 14 days of trying to uh, titrate off of Oxycontin. And uh, of course, I got sent back but of course, only one part of my disease was treated, the, you know, the physical aspect, the mental compulsion and spiritual malady, not even touched. So I go back to Washington, now I can't sleep. So I'd start taking Ambien and other sleeping pills, you know. Five months later, I'm arrested at three in the morning for driving under the influence, um, and I'm on my way back to the same hospital that I was at five months earlier. This time, though, I had to go to the mental health clinic. And thank God I did, because I got to uh, get back into treatment. And, uh, but it is so indicative of our system of care that, you know, I had congressional coverage, so I had the best health care you could have. And, and boy, did I, was I a frequent flyer? You know, I... <laughs> It's a good thing I was in Congress at the time because I racked up some pretty good health benefits. They don't pay you much in Congress, but in terms of what I drew down on my health benefits, I got my money's worth <laughs> serving you, the American people. <clears throat> but isn't it shocking that our health insurance system didn't like, you know, wake up and say, listen, he's been in treatment half a dozen times already. We better do some serious wraparound when he gets out, because if we don't keep him in recovery, he's just going to be costing us another 30 grand. But that's not what, how they think. And of course, I get out and they, you know, they say, well, you're supposed to go to the program and get a sponsor and all that, but they're leaving it all up to me. <laughs> I 
it's a problem. <laughs> you don't want to do that. So, and of course, I could not still be seen, you know, or even really spill the beans in, in, in 12-step recovery because I was so self-conscious about my reputation. Isn't that ironic that I was so worried about how I was going to be perceived and yet by trying to shield my reputation, I cost my reputation. Because since I didn't take care of myself, I ended up constantly being talked about on Capitol Hill. Did you see Patrick was out at the bars the other night? Did you hear that he was over at the liquor store getting a bottle of Belvedere, at, you know, sneaking in and out when no one, he thought no one was watching? So it's, it's shocking. Now that I have the longest period of continuous sobriety, which is only a year and a, two years, two and a half years, February 22nd. 2011. <clears throat> um, so I'm really new in recovery, but it is shocking that um, it does take, you know, what it takes to, for us to get here. And uh, for me, it was uh, my, do my dad's uh, fatal illness and coming to terms with that in my life and thinking about my own life. That was my moment of clarity. I, I should have had many moments of clarity before then, but you, know, you never know what it ultimately is that tips you over into thinking there's, you want to live in a different way and, and in the solution as opposed to in the problem. So, um, so back to Congress. I return from, from rehab and I get a lot of uh, members of Congress that I don't know very well ask to meet with me. So, of course, I'm not, you know, used to all this solicitation. I go over to their offices. A lot of them on the other side of the aisle. In case you don't know, I'm a Democrat. And uh, so I go over to their office. I bring my staff. And invariably they say, no, no, uh, you know, because usually staff is the one that do, does the work. So you've got to have our staff meet your staff, and then we work the staff out, and then we were told what to do. So I'd show up, and they'd say, you know, send the staff away. I just want to talk to you. Well, of course, the light goes on in my head. I know what they want to talk about. But they never knew who else to talk to. And I never realized that the worst moment in my life where I thought it was all over, my constituents were calling for my head, you know, the opposition was saying that I should resign the seat, that I was a disgrace to my state and to my district. Um, that, that what ended up happening is the complete opposite. The next election, I was reelected by the biggest margins of my whole political career, if you can believe it. <laughs> but that's, if, in case you want to get into politics, I do not recommend that you take that as a political route. Uh, to success. So what happened was I, I go and visit with these members of Congress and they tell me these hair-raising stories because isn't it the case when we're comparing what we, our problems to everyone else's problems, we'll take our problems back every, every day. And colleagues of mine that I never would have suspected, you know, dealing not only in their own lives with profound addiction, and dressing up and looking good. But also their family members, them telling me about how their spouse had tried to commit suicide or their father had uh, committed suicide with firearms or their daughter with an eating disorder been hospitalized multiple times. And so I got all these stories and to a person I kept their confidence and, and that's the way it is. And Fast forward a year and a half later, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act is on the floor, and I look up on the board when it comes to voting, and I see many of these same members of Congress who told me these hair-raising stories vote no on the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So I didn't say anything. I, shocked as I was, I waited, and just luckily it passed, so... You know, in the, in the weeks and months afterwards, I would stop them and I'd say, can we talk? And then I would ask them, well, why could, couldn't you vote for this? I thought we had a really powerful conversation. They said, Patrick, I don't come from the part of the country you do. In my part of the country, we, I come from the buckle of the Bible Belt. 
And in my part of the country, these are looked upon as moral issues, not medical issues. They're looked upon as character issues, not chemistry issues. And uh, if anyone were ever to find out that I voted like something on mental health or addiction, they'd probably ask and start inquiring why I did that. And if, I, if they did, and if they ever found out that my daughter was hospitalized multiple times, you know what, that would be such an awful burden on my daughter. And I don't want to bring that shame on her. She's got enough to deal with. And frankly, I feel guilty that she's been hospitalized because I don't think I've been a good enough father. I mean, these, this is the stuff that colleagues of mine were pouring out as reasons why they could not vote to have health care insurance treat their family's illness the same way they, it would if they had leukemia or cancer or diabetes. And we're in the year, and this, this was 2008. So the bill did pass the House. It goes to the Senate. And of course, like everything else, it sits there, and it sits there, and it sits there. And then we have this thing called the market crash in 2008. And that happened at the end of our session. So, you know, we're going into election season in 2008, and we're about to wrap up all of our votes, and we're really not going to stick around, but we have to deal with this, you know, major crisis in the financial markets. So first, uh, we put up the TARP bill, the Toxic Asset Relief Program, and in the last five minutes of the vote clock, and there's 15-minute vote, votes, uh, it was clear to me from looking at the board that we, the TARP bill was going to go down. It was going to fail. And I was sitting there with my colleagues watching um, Wall Street, the numbers. Our market dropped 6,000 points in the period of 10 minutes because Wall Street was watching what was happening in Congress because they wanted to know whether the American people were going to put the full faith and credit of the United States behind backing our financial institutions so there wouldn't be a further degradation of our financial system. That's the kind of crisis we were living in. So, of course, it didn't pass, and the market went south. We all went home, not knowing what to do. And the very same people who said for us not to vote for TARP the previous week started calling us up and saying, vote for TARP now. We get it. So what happened? We came back the next week. At this point, my father was convalescing from brain surgery because of his uh, glioblastoma, brain cancer. And he had become the sponsor of the parity bill in the Senate after the untimely death of our hero, Paul Wellstone. And I said to him, you know, Dad, I really need you to call in some favors. And uh, he had a lot of favors to call in. And... He called up his best friend in the Senate, Chris Dodd, who we all recall was chairman of the ever most important committee at that time, the Banking Committee. But Chris Dodd also was the substitute for my father on the Health Committee. I mean, talk about divine providence and we can't make this up. Chris Dodd put the TARP language on 1424, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So you're now looking at the member of Congress who sponsored the largest bailout of banks in American history. That's me. That's me. I, I'm the one who, who wrote the TARP bill. My name was a sponsor of the largest bailout in American history. Of course, no one knows that because it's they know that TARP got signed, but when Bush signed TARP, he was signing the Mental Health Parity Bill. <clears throat> My point is that we didn't just pass parity because Congress thought, wouldn't it be nice to cover the brain like any other organ in the body? We didn't pass parity because all of a sudden all those advocacy groups came out of the shadows and said, treat our illness like every other illness. 
We didn't pass the parity bill because all of a sudden people said, this has got to be done for our good for our country, our veterans, our communities. We passed the parity bill as an accidental casualty to the legislative process where we had some great you know, maneuvering in the back rooms of Congress and, and we got the job done. My point is that we cannot think and, and think with pride that we're anywhere in the movement just because we have this language. In fact, it's been five years since that law was passed and the way Congress ordinarily works when the Congress passes a bill, the president has to execute enacting regulations and rules, implementing the federal legislation. And it's been five years and as all of you know, there is still no final rule on this ever important piece of legislation called Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So my point is that we have a long ways to go as a community to get our political advocacy to where it needs to be so it's such that we are effective on behalf of all the people that we try to serve. And so the subject of my speech is supposed to be, you know, evidence-based and, and, and that kind of conveys the notion that there is an evidence base. And of course, thanks to foundations, there is the beginning of the tracking of an evidence base and what works and what outcomes are. But we are in the formative stages in our movement, both of public policy, but also in, as a field in healthcare. So let me just give you a brief outline of the parity bill for those of you who don't know. In the, the language of this federal law that President Bush signed, we say, as Andrew Cohen mentioned, that if, if uh, you have mental health and addiction services, they need to be covered with parity, on par, and that with analogous comparison to. That's what parity means. So we said if it's inpatient, in network, we're inpatient out of network. If you cover leukemia, if you cover diabetes, if you cover stroke, you've got to cover, you know, illnesses of the brain. If it's inpatient out of network and outpatient out of network, and you cover primary, secondary, tertiary care for diabetes, if you cover it for cancer, if you cover someone if they have cardiovascular disease or stroke, you got to cover it in an analogous way for mental health and addiction services. For pharmacy, for emergency room services, if you cover it, you've got to cover it the same for mental health and addiction. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. But, of course, you know, we are like, way behind the rest of healthcare because we've never had our field reimbursed. So there isn't the kind of, you know, really strong evidence base because we've never paid for this. No one's bothered to pay for it and track it and, and uh, measure it. <clears throat> but now the hope is that this is what we're going to begin to do. And just like foundations, has learned, and I commend Rob for the fantastic model that he set in negotiating the best contracts with insurance companies that are out there in our field. And believe me, Rob didn't get those contracts because, you know, he, you know, he's a good negotiator. He got those contracts because he was able to give comfort to those insurance companies that if they paid for this, you know, he could show them that it was worth their investment. It would pay dividends. And frankly, I think that's where our advocacy needs to be. You know, and, and it's kind of heretical to say it in mental health, but we're all carved out. You have, op, you know, Optum, Beacon Strategies, Value Options. Insurance companies take their mental health budget 
just carve it out and micromanage people with mental illness and addiction. <clears throat> but the value for providing mental health and addiction is realized not just in the person who recovers from addiction and mental illness, the value in terms of the dollars saved, which really matters to the rest of the world, is in reducing your diabetes costs because you dealt with the addiction, to reduce your cardiovascular disease costs because you dealt with depression, to reduce your you know, heart disease because you dealt with addiction and depression and, and mental illness. That's where the value is. So if we stay as a community, as a carve out, You'll never get the attention of the anthems and the Uniteds and the Blue Crosses in the world who will say, but this is just a big cost. How do we minimize our exposure? How do we minimize our cost? Because we'll always be a lost loser in terms of showing that spending money on treatment is going to be a, a real dividend payer. But this is going to be an open and shut case if we are patients that are also being tracked for our costs and asthma and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and the like. So, you know, we're going to need to make a big leap here and jump into the pool with everyone else. And the way that we track outcomes and integrate care, and what I mean by integration is not only do I mean integration in our, amongst ourselves, in other words, you know, and this false dichotomy of psychiatry and neurology, like of mental health and substance use. I mean, this is just, it, it's hard to believe we still, you know, act this way, where the funding streams are all separate, depending if you have a, a mental illness or addiction. And I get beat up all the time when I talk about mental illness, and then someone says, well, you didn't mention addiction. I said, well, addiction is one of the mental illnesses that I'm talking about, but just because our nomenclature is so profoundly inadequate, um, we're, we're at, at a real loss here to integrate care. <clears throat> Even in intellectual disabilities, we're not integrating mental health care and addiction services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Because we think, oh, they're already taken care of. They're in that box over there called IDD. They, they're, they're, that whole brain, that mental health, that's, no, no. We're t treating their, their intellectual developmental disability, but we're not treating their underlying anxiety disorders and other uh, illnesses. It's shocking. So we not only need to integrate within the SUD, SMI, and IDD community, we need to integrate in the rest of whole health care. So, this is going to take a lot of tracking, and making sure we're tracking the right things is going to mean that we're measuring the right progress. So it's going to be really important as a community that we really understand what the rules of the game are so that we can make the best case to the payers, not only insurers, but the government, that this is worth their investment. And so, I know as a field we've never had the money to both pay the workforce and reimburse for the care and invest in the science of, of doing this tracking, but we need to. Because if we don't, we'll always be on the margins. In addition to that, if we don't integrate, we'll always be that segregated system. So I uh, went back to Mayo uh, last year. And I often go back for, to connect with my treatment providers. But this time I was going back to visit one of my colleagues who was there. And just like me, he didn't want anyone to know he was there. And when I arrived there, he said, Patrick, you didn't have to come. Why would you spend all this time and energy coming out to visit me? And I said, Jesse because when you're on the road to recovery, someday you're going to come back and you're going to visit someone who's in your shoes today and you're going to be able to tell them that recovery is possible and there is reason to hope. Because I'm here to tell you I was exactly where you were in my life and I never thought that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm here to tell you today 
there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and you'll see it too, but you've got to stay in recovery and just slog through it, trudge this happy road of destiny, because someday you're going to be of service in ways that you can't even imagine in the service that you've already provided your country as a member of Congress. And his eyes opened up. He said, thank you. I said, no, no, thank you for the opportunity for me to pass the message because that gives me a, a feeling of purpose. And don't what, isn't that what we really want in our lives, a sense of purpose and meaning? So this is how it, how it works. We've got to organize ourselves. We've got a special message. But part of the care that we're going to have is both the medical side, but it's also the non-medical. So as Andrew mentioned, I started this organization called One Mind for Research. I started that on the anniversary of my uncle, President Kennedy's uh, speech about going to the moon. Because I thought that everyone kept referring to the brain as the last medical frontier. And, you know, like a good politician, uh, you know, I thought frontier, frontier. They used to say President Kennedy's administration was the new frontier. I'll just call my cousin Caroline and we'll have this thing all tied up. And, uh, <laughs> And Caroline said to me, Patrick, I love your passion, but you know, we've already got the president and all the leaders of Congress honoring daddy at this big event at the Capitol. And you know, I know you want to, you know, focus all the energy on brain research, but you know, we just can't do it. I said, Oh, it's too bad. She then she said to me, But you can have Daddy's library on May 25th. And I said, Caroline, what is May 25th? And she said, That's when he gave this uh, moonshot speech. And all of a sudden, the light went off again. I said, Caroline, that's perfect. So I invited all the NIH directors. And by the way, there's a dozen that study the brain. Talk about fragmentation, siloing. Um, we're all studying the same organ of the body, by the way. But there's 12 separate plus institutes that research the brain. You'd think we'd kind of learn from cancer, kind of get the National Cancer Institute version of brain research, not there. So we, I invited all these NIH directors. I invited the president. The president was over in Europe, so he sent the vice president. And we said at this uh, library event that instead of going to outer space, we needed to go to inner space. And I said to all the neuroscientists there, you know what, you're the astronauts of our new mission. And all of a sudden, they put their Blackberries down and their iPads down, and they stood up a little straighter. And I said, and even more so, you know what? We need to put the American flag on your shoulder. And they were like, well, what do you mean? I said, because you're doing the work of our country. You're going to be the first responders. You're our 911 force. Jesus, these people started feeling good about themselves. <laughs> I said, because you know what? Our returning heroes are coming back from war. And guess what they say is the signature wound? Traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. You know what? They're prisoners of war. Al-Qaeda has taken these prisoners of war, our soldiers. They're walking amongst us as prisoners of their war injuries, of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. We need you to go in there and kick down the doors just like SEAL Team 6 and bring them home. And Jesus, I got a big applause. <laughs> and so, you know, I had the, uh, the head of the, Tom Insel came up to me afterwards in the National Institutes of Mental Health. He said, Patrick, whatever you need me to do, I've never been called an astronaut before. <laughs> I said, Tom, you know what, it's, it's a good thing. He said, I appreciate it, because no one ever thanks us for how important our work is. Just like they very rarely thank you for the work that you do. So. We, uh, I said, let's get our mission to inner space. Put all the NIH directors together and define how we do this together. What's the big science of brain research that's going to yield? So that we're not like, oh, let's just study alcoholism here or addiction here. And we got NIDA over here studying alcoholism, addiction. You got National Institutes of Mental Health over here studying depression and anxiety. 
Has anybody woken up and thought maybe this work is all kind of together, like the mechanisms of the brain affect all these symptoms that they overlap? And I'm not a neuroscientist, but I said neuroscience needs political science. You know, we need to organize ourselves better. And so we launched this mission, General Pete Corelli, four-star general, who led the effort to try to start studying suicides in the military partnered up with NIMH to research suicides. First five-year report of STARS is coming out this fall, and, uh, and it not it something that more of our veterans die at their own hands, not veterans, more of our active duty soldiers die at their own hands than are killed in combat last year. Yeah, you'd think that would be on the front page of every newspaper in America, and it isn't. Two days ago, I was at the Largest mental health institution in the nation, Cook County Jail, Chicago. Isn't that something? <clears throat> and so I said to, so I said to them, do you uh, count how many veterans you have? No, Congressman, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so only two years ago, the Rhode Island legislature um, started counting every intake of everybody that was processed and the Adult Corrections Institute. So I went to, to uh, Shinseki, the secretary of the VA, I said, do you know how many veterans are locked up behind bars as we speak? He said, no, the data is three years old, and it's inconclusive because no one actually reports it. We get, you know, rough estimates. I said, you could go to CVS or Walgreens and find out what you bought last week because everything's barcoded. Why can't we find out real time how many of our American heroes are locked up behind bars where we're the prisoner of war camp and we're taking our own heroes hostage? He said, I'll write a letter to the governors and ask them to report it to me. But my point here is this is how far behind we are in terms of advocacy because we all know how well we present when we're active in our illness, we're not a very sympathetic lot. We don't hold much political sway. And also, because we're all anonymous, no one knows that we're as big a group as we are. So they don't respond to us. But if you want to make a difference on the Hill, you put this in terms that it should be put in and that we're letting our American heroes, we're leaving them behind on the battlefield. And I guarantee you, Republican and Democrat, it doesn't matter, we'll all come to their rescue. But as a community, we haven't put our political messaging together such that we can be, have a winning message. And if we win it for the veterans, frankly, we win it for all Americans. 72% of the veterans will never go to the VA in their lifetime. Most people don't know, they think they all go to the VA. Especially if you can't see the injury, right, from the outside. They don't want, they want to deny it. They oh, I'm fine, I'll shake it off. So they're in our midst. They're going to their private employer. And their private employer, by the way, Walmart says they're going to hire 100,000 veterans in the next 10 years. Has, has Walmart thought about what their health insurance plan is going to look like in terms of whether it adequately covers the signature wound of the war? I guarantee it, they haven't thought it through. So we're in a formative time. We have our ret heroes returning. We have the federal law, gonna, it's going to be defined. We're hopefully to get a final rule on this within the next month or so. Um, we have health care reform moving forward, which is the most profound change that we've had in the delivery and def definition of health care in our lifetimes. All of it's going to be happening in the next few years. And so if we don't get our advocacy together to commensurate with all these big changes, we're going to miss the best opportunity we have to make sure we are treated the same and given the priority that we need to be given in terms of providing health care and, and whatever health care means to, that is defined to make a difference in, in return on investment. Because it may be the support of housing needs to be reimbursed in health care. Now, who would have imagined, like, you pay for housing? Right? That's not health care. It reduces medical costs. Let's provide, 
you know, support of, you know, uh, living services. Well, what the hell does that mean? I don't know. It's a recovery, supported in the community. I don't know, but it reduces the number of ER visits. See, in other words, if we're not tracking this, we can't make the case that what we do is of value, that we're not looked upon any longer by the rest of the medical community as a cost. We're going to look, look, be looked upon as an investment. That's how we need to have it changed. But there's another thing that needs to change, and that's the, the self-stigmatization. So, you know, we're all cognizant of our privacy, and we want extra HIPAA regs and higher standards for, for our medical records as it relates to the rest of healthcare. I'm here to tell you that's a loser. Because what that means is you treat me in a behavioral health setting and know that I had, you know, my brain was saturated with opioids for so many years, and then no one knows that, and then I get into an accident, and they're wheeling me into Atlantic City uh, Hospital emergency room, and they're trying to figure out how to, you know, triage me, and they don't know this about me. They could kill me. So, you know, or, or I'm being treated, and I have a bunch of meds on board, and nobody knows that. So they, they wheel me into the hospital, they put an IV in, and they start giving me a bunch of meds. They could kill me. So we as a community also need to figure out how we're going to be working in a whole new way. Because it is actually now considered within SAMHSA to promulgate separate, separate standards for privacy for behavioral health records, which will make you know, Rob's job trying to track the value of integration, impossible. Forget the personal element that I've just spoken about in terms of life and death implications. So I, I'm like throwing it all out there because carve outs have been our thing. Medical privacy has been our thing. I'm just here to tell you those things are things of the past. And that's going to be a tough thing for our advocacy movement because they're not, they're not prepared because they're still stuck in the old mindset of this is how we have to fight for what we can get. So a lot is in the process of changing. A final uh, comment I would make is that uh, we're going to, I figured out that this thing called uh, John F. Kennedy is a pretty good um, lure to bring people together. And so... I, I, I'm bringing the show back again, and this time it's to mark uh, the last major bill that my uncle signed into law, which was the Mental Health, uh, Community Mental Health Act of 1963. And, uh, and that story is profound. You know, my Aunt Rosemary with an intellectual disability, nobody knew it. He was elected president of the United States, and no one in, in his family would ever speak of it. And it was only two years into office that he allowed his sister, my aunt Eunice Shriver, who, by the way, was the founder of one of the greatest organizations ever created, the Special Olympics, allowed my aunt Eunice to go out and talk about uh, their sister, Rosemary, my aunt Rosemary with intellectual disability. And in this uh, study that I've done of my family, I recognized that in the last 25 years of my grandparents' lives, they never once saw my, their, their daughter because she was institutionalized out in Wisconsin. There was a decision whether that she should go to Massachusetts or whether she should go to Wisconsin. And there was a feeling, well, Massachusetts is close and everybody will know, so maybe Wisconsin be a better place. I'm just telling you because that kind of shame and stigma has been is through my family, and my family is pretty progressive, pretty open-minded, pretty enlightened. My uncle was the first president to address civil rights as a United States president, talking about the moral issue of that time, and he said, who amongst us would trade the color of their skin and be content with those who counsel patience and delay? In other words, if you thought it was hunky-dory being an American, just try walking in the shoes of someone with a different colored skin and think about you would feel being treated like a second-class citizen in our country. 
And boy, couldn't that paradigm be put right on people with who, with an immutable characteristic of their being, and that is a brain illness. Just as real as the color of their skin or their gender, anything else that's an integral to who they are, and they're being marginalized, discriminated against, you know, segregated in our country. And we're all saying the same thing as we said 50 years ago. Wait, now is not the time. So we need to take a lesson from the great leadership of people like Dr. King and stand up and be counted and fight because we have an obligation to those people who are dying every day, suffering in silence. 38,000 people take their lives every year. 18 veterans a day. When are we going to wake up as Americans and treat these issues as integral to our national health and security? It's shocking we live in this country at this day and age, and we're so silent on these issues. And then everybody wants, you know what the answer is going to be next week or next month in the Congress? Putting everyone with a behavioral health record on a big, giant database so they can't buy guns. That's going to be Congress's answer. I'm telling you now. That's the legislation. That's what's being pushed. It's been adopted already by several states, including progressive states like New York. Shocking. Shocking. And then we read these tragedies, and you look at the history of the shooter. If this person was laying on the side of the road bleeding, we would have called 911. They would have gotten them the medical treatment. But when your illness is a brain illness, and it manifests itself in, quote, strange, bizarre behavior, we look at it as a character issue, not a chemistry issue. We look the other way. We cross the street. We can't be bothered. We walk down the street. People are muttering to themselves, shouting. We look the other way. We can't abide. We don't know what to do. Would we treat any other physical illness in this country like that? Of course we wouldn't. And it's an outrage in this day and age that we still do that. We've got to figure out what we're doing because if we can't capture this message, we're never going to be able to fight for the kind of reimbursement and kind of health care dignity that is going to be required not only by law but required to treat your family member with the kind of care and dignity that they deserve. So that is what's before us as a nation. And I think that if we can keep organized and I Look forward to getting your ideas on all this in the coming months and years. We're going to be able to make a, a big change. But like civil rights, we can never write out of the hearts of the American people bigotry. We can never write out of the hearts of the people prejudice. But we can write and enshrine in the laws of the land that discrimination, overt and real, is no longer going to be possible and sanctioned in this great country against the mentally ill and those with substance use disorders. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congressman Kennedy. We're, I am, I'm very honored to be standing on this podium with you. And thank you for sharing so much about your own story and your own life and your own family. So uh, if any of you in this room, if you heard one thing from, from Congressman Kennedy, if you're waiting on Washington to solve our industry problems, you're going to be waiting a long time. So if we're going to solve our industry problems, where is it going to start? It's going to start in rooms like this. And so that's part of what we're here to talk about, and I'm going to share, Siobhan is going to share some research with you in just a moment, some real results. But before we get there, I want to talk about why that's important. Do you have the laptop? I want to talk with you about why that's important uh, and, and what we're attempting to accomplish. I'm going to start my piece of the presentation, though, with a confession. My confession is that I believe my program is better than yours. And if you're sitting in this room and you're a program CEO, leader, executive director, I suspect you think your program's better than mine and is better than the other person's down the, down the row from you or the person sitting in front of you. That's a problem, folks. You want to know why that's a problem? <laughs> 
Well, it starts with this. First of all, there's 14,500 of us. All right, let's start there. Let me start to the next statistic. The next, the next statistic is that there's 24 million people right now in the U.S. who are struggling with substance abuse and addiction. And you know what? Only 4 million of them seek treatment. Only 2 million of them get it. Folks, there's no shortage. We don't have to be competitive. Or we don't have to be competitive. In fact, if we would start gathering together and plan the work and work the plan, we might take 4 million to 5 million. We might take 5 million to 6 million. And then we really don't need, we truly don't have to worry about being competitive at all. But what is, what is it going to take? Well, the, the biggest difference from the 4 million gap to the 24 million gap, 20 million people, in my opinion, because I haven't talked to them, but in my opinion, it is the stigma that Congressman Kennedy is talking about. Folks don't want to be identified with what they believe is a character flaw or, or what they believe is some other condition that is not a brain disorder. And so that is where we've got to start gathering together. That's part of why I'm very honored to have Congressman Kennedy up here. He has formed an organization that is called One Mind for Research. One Mind for Research. I put out there to you guys that that should be synonymous with one mind for recovery. Because in this current world right now, we cannot separate one from the other. Here's what happens when we go to Congress. First of all, Congress expects us to come to them with answers, all right, to give them the answers, to draft the bills, to write the legislation, and they go, okay, that's good, yeah, I'll put it out there. They're not gonna draft it for us, and they're not sitting around coming up with their own answers. So what that means is, is that when we go before them, and Congressman Kennedy gave one example, in the Affordable Care Act right now, we have not yet defined the rules under which we must operate, okay, the rules for parity under the Affordable Care Act, which hopefully happens this year. But here's, here's, a, here's an example. There's what is defined as the essential health benefits. What should the Affordable Care Act cover? Well, we've got to figure that out. And within the essential health benefits, what's considered the scope of service? Right now, you guys, the only thing that is defined in the essential health benefits is acute hospitalization in and out of network, outpatient treatment in and out of network, and then all the other ancillary services, emergency rooms and doctor's visits. And so we say, you can imagine, wait a minute, Congressman, what about residential treatment? Where does that fall? And we can get to Congress and they'll go, that's a great idea. You know what, we should probably put that in there. What is it? And we say, um, well, you know, sometimes it depends on which state you're in, but it could be an apartment with a clinic down the street, or it could be 24-hour care, or what's 24-hour? Here's the problem, guys. We can't define it ourselves, all right? So when we stand before Congress and we go, geez, I don't really know what residential treatment, it means so many things, and they go, well, go back and figure it out and come back and let us know. That's a problem. So that's what we're here to talk about. I'm going to move fast, fast, fast. Oh, and by the way, my confession is this. I'm over it. If you want to know what we do and how we do it, I'm going to tell you. I'll tell you, I'll show you, I'll bring you in, whatever you want to know. That's part of what this presentation is about. It's a big step for me, by the way. <laughs> this is not easy to do. Uh, uh, this is what the parity law is. And, and just last little point here, you guys already know that we are moving towards an, an environment of pay for performance. It's part of what Congressman was talking about, that I've been able to negotiate higher than market value insurance rates because I can demonstrate outcomes, and it's something that you've got to be thinking about, too. So research. Um, Evidence-based. Boy, we are bandying around a lot of terms in this industry right now. Evidence-based, integrated treatment, outcomes. What does evidence-based mean? Well, here's the definition, okay? In fact, if you'll think about uh, right now, we're kind of driving with our eyes wide open in the industry. We're driving with our eyes, eyes wide open in this industry, but we're looking in our rear view mirror. Okay, we're looking in our rear view mirror, so we really aren't looking, about, looking at where we're going. So this is the definition of what evidence-based is about. It's scientific evidence that means we're meeting industry-established benchmarks for reliability and validity. Let's make sure we keep throwing those two words out there. Put those on, on our websites. Uh, via clinical trials, case studies, journal articles, and then long-term studies. <clears throat> this generally involves that baseline and that we're meeting baseline enrollment thresholds. Okay, we're not saying all of those who came through our treatment program and stayed for the entire period of time and who had a great experience who we happened to call uh, the select sample a year later. 
This is generally involving baseline enrollment thresholds, follow-up thresholds, and independent verification of results. It's clinical expertise from the experts, McClellan, McGovern, and others, uh, patient needs and choices. By the way, you can't throw that out. Evidence base involves the feedback loop between patient needs and choices. I'll tell you why about that as well as I try to move through. So here are some of the categories that we're currently looking at in our organization. I'll be happy to tell you more, but I'm trying to move quickly. We talk about effectiveness. Effectiveness is uh, what you're doing accomplishing the goals in the normal treatment environment. We look at efficacy. There's an opportunity to introduce uh, controlled interventions actually in a controlled environment, right? Whoops. Let me go back on that. Fidelity. There's a great term for you. Are we practicing what we preach? Uh, efficiency, and then it's actually, are we actually using the information? Here's what's inf really important is, are we taking the outcomes, even if we don't like them? Are we taking the outcomes and changing what we do? All right, that's efficiency. Uh, that's actually being open to change, and the last one is satisfaction. Are we actually paying attention to what our customers want and what we need, or do, are we going with what we think they want and what they need? I kind of referenced this, num this uh, slide earlier, outcomes versus outcomes informed. Uh, outcomes we're talking about, we're introducing kind of a new term here called uh, outcomes informed, and that is that we're taking the outcomes and we're willing to change. It's one thing to say we're doing research and we're tracking outcomes, here are our outcomes. It's another thing to say, okay, our outcomes told us this, now are we willing to change? Y'all, moments of change, that's what this conference is about. We've got to be open to the fact that what we've always done and doing things the same old ways may not be the best way. Not bad, but there may be better ways that we can move people toward long-term recovery. And that means gathering information from consumers, clinicians, management, or policymakers. The last term, though, is the one that's most important to me, which is being accountable. Putting it out there, putting it out there to our patients, our families, ourselves, policymakers, uh, and being willing to be held accountable for the results. Integrated treatment is one that gets bandied around a lot. SAMHSA has its own definition. I don't need to make it up for you. It's already there. Uh, and it is the process of merging separate clinical services to meet the individual needs. That's really going to be the bottom line here, is when somebody comes in your door, do you take them and try to force them into your treatment box? Or when they come in the door, do you wrap your treatment around them? That's ultimately what integrated treatment is about. Well, in order to do that, you've got to do a very thorough uh, assessment. You've got to have the screening. You've got to have treatment planning, your coordinated treatment, and your continuing care that reflect the same. <coughs> integrated treatment, this is the term I'm talking about, fidelity. If you want to be held up to a standard of integrated treatment, there is one. Uh, Dartmouth Psychiatric Research Institute developed the DDCAT, the Dual Diagnosis Capability and Addiction Treatment to score yourself. Use it. It's a great tool. It's a fantastic tool. Dr. Mark McGovern, who actually helped develop the tool, came and scored us in 2007. They'll call you, they either rank you as, okay, you're a substance abuse only treatment center. That's fine, well and good. You're capable of integrated treatment or you're enhanced. And I can't miss the marketing plug, sorry guys. But we were listed in the top 5% as dual diagnosis enhanced and he sent me an email later that said you're the gold standard for integrated treatment. But there is the tool out there to track it. All of this to say that we've got to build credibility and respect in our industry. Uh, if you want to claim those terms, then you need to be using nationally recognized, valid, reliable tools for measure. Baseline measures uh, to establish the statistic, statistical validity and reliability. Um, and, regard, and then the uh, methods and the volumes have to be consistent. Follow-up time frames. If I ask you when you're doing follow-up, what are yours? They're probably different than mine. Uh, the national standard for us right now is 30 days, six months, one year, three times follow-up post-treatment, not just one. More than that, you've got to get independent third-party validation. The research that Siobhan is about to come up here and show you, I just wanted to give you the context within which that it comes from. It comes from attempting to enroll 100% of your patients in research, 100%. No filtering. They had a great experience. They left ACA. It doesn't matter. Attempting to enroll at the time they come in your door baseline. That's where you'll establish your baseline, 100% enrollment. It's acceptable if you get a minimum of 80% of people to participate, to agree to participate. So 80% enrollment, you're completing follow-up calls three times, 30 days, six months, one year, and oh, by the way, 
it takes an average of 15 calls to complete those follow-ups. And then you've got to achieve that successful follow-up on at least 60%, right? During the follow-up process, you've got to reach 60% of those that agreed to enroll. And then last but not least, you've got to have some independent third party, an institutional review board, uh, something similar to that if, you, if you're going to be looking at research. All of that to say, uh, that's actually it's the evidence-based work. It's this kind of work that then allows us to be driving the car with our eyes wide open, seeing the vision of where we need to go, actually gathering all the information that we need to have and need to know to make good decisions about where we're going to drive and not go off the tracks. So all that to say, Siobhan, I'm going to let you come up and show them the research. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Congressman Kennedy. Um, so this is, well, I'm very loud. This is what happens um, when we don't treat the opiate addictions. This is the costs, $56 billion annually. This is out of the literature, out of a 2011 publication. That's over $28 billion in missed days of work, lost productivity, another $18 billion in like ancillary healthcare costs, emergency room visits, you know, doctor's office visits, overnight stays, right? So research is the solution to this. Understanding the problem and providing effective treatment for all of these new people who are gonna be coming into our healthcare system. So this is what we do at Foundations, right? Um, the study that I'm gonna to present to you is approximately 1,500 people that we were able to follow up we collected data at admission, like Rob said, we enrolled them using an informed consent developed by an IRB, using a protocol, and um, then we collect data at post-treatment time points, and we use standardized instruments as well as a 26-item satisfaction instrument that we've developed. So what we discovered when we first went to the literature is that um, we have a number of assumptions about opiate users that are inherent in the literature that tell us who opiate users are. And like this first assumption is sort of, we know who you are, right? And generally, when you look at the literature, you see they're economically depressed, they're underemployed, they tend to be minorities, and there's this treatment resistant, like they're just not ready, right? Sort of um, assumption in the literature regarding opiate users. We found something completely different. We found that our opiate users were just as likely to be employed as anybody else who walks through our doors for treatment. We found they work almost the exact same number of days as anybody else who comes in our doors for treatment. We found they're primarily ca Caucasian and they're primarily male, and check out the last one, right? They're just as ready to make a change in their lives as anybody else who comes into treatment. That's really huge, because I know, at least I worked in treatment for a long time, and it doesn't always feel like that. And we have this tendency to go on our experience and kind of package that as our research. The second assumption really deals with that, right? Opiate, um, opiate addicts tend to need different types of treatment. They need something new. They need something different. We can't treat them the same way. They're very resistant, right? Well, we found something, again, different from that. What we found is they're just as likely to complete treatment as anybody else, you know, regardless of what it feels like on any given day, right? In fact, their opiate users are more likely to stay in private residential treatment than anyone else who, you know, at the 30-day point, they're more likely to be there than people with other addiction disorders. We found that surprising. Here's something else really significant that we found. We began really diving into this opiate population. We divided them into two groups, you know, sort of our college age, younger users, and our older users, right? And um, we found that the younger users do resemble the literature. They look just like what's out there, you know, in the, in the classic five and 10 year ago type of methadone type treatment literature. They, they have a tendency to act out. They have a lot more legal issues, possibly some violent behavior stuff. And then there's this whole other group of, of um, not terribly old, but older, <laughs> um, 26 plus, right? That um, they have a higher severity of medical and psych symptoms. They're sort of acting in. They've got depression. They're more likely to have had a, a suicide attempt or a suicide thought. They're very concerned about the relationships in their life, right? These, are, these suggest two very different treatment models. Not that you can't treat them in the same place, but 
this is really, see how this, this outcomes informed idea is just informing treatment right now in a very real way? When you understand that this is who you're treating, you can have the interventions and the programming in place to make a difference in that life. That makes sense. And so that final assumption was, you know, and it's, it's generally in the literature, that um, opiate users fail. They don't stay clean. They don't stay sober, right? They need something different, right? And um, we found that to be not the case as well. So this first line that I'm showing you is other opiates, and that's prescription opiate use. That's where they fall. And, and what that is basically, what this is showing you is at six months post-treatment, these are the sustained results from when they first got to treatment. We were able to collect this data in 74% um, follow-up rates. So we have approximately an eight, between 80 and 90, it varies, um, enrollment rate with a 74% follow-up rate, better than 74%. And that represents an 87% decrease in opiate use in that overall population. Um, there was also decreases in um, the heroin use as well as the non-medical methadone use. And it's no coincidence that you see such a huge decline in the other opiate use. Because what we've got also is the ability to deal with the severity of the medical issues. See, those are going to go hand in hand, especially with this 26-year-old pop, you know, plus population that's coming in with severe psychological and medical issues. We're going to probably need a new conversation. And it's exactly what Congressman Kennedy is talking about. Guess what? The brain's part of the body. Well, the body's part of the body, too, right? And, and so, you know, we've spent all of this time working, okay, co-occurring, co-occurring, we've got to deal, you know, mental health and addiction treatment, mental health and addiction treatment. We may need to add this comorbidity factor in as well and start preparing ourselves to deal with the entire individual. That's going to be key. And um, so in terms of quality of life, these are all severity scores that at six months showed sustained results in legal issues, family problems, psychiatric problems, and of course the medical issues. So, this is the change that we want to see, and we kind of need to be the change that we want to see in the world, right? And I think that research is really going to be what allows us to have that vision Rob was talking about, you know, and drive that car called behavioral health. So if the eyes are the window to the soul, then maybe research is the window to our future. Thanks.